let's look at measures of variability. The variability or dispersion of a variable is often important in practical situations. For example, packaged food producers want to put a consistent amount of product into each package. They would like very little variability in the weight of the product. And the variability in a stock's price is a very important factor in pricing stock options. There are many different measures of variability, and let's start with a simple one, the range. The range is the difference between the largest and smallest observations, or in other words, the maximum minus the minimum. Consider this sample of four observations. This first value we'll call x1, second one x2, third one x3, and the fourth one x4. The range is the maximum value, 68, minus the minimum value. 45, which works out to 23. The range is pretty easy to calculate and interpret, but it's not a great measure of variability. The range doesn't tell us anything about the spread of the values between the maximum and the minimum. Better measures of variability are based on the deviations from the mean. Every observation has a deviation associated with it. The deviation is simply the value of the observation minus the mean. For this sample of four observations, if we calculated the mean, we'd see that the mean x bar is equal to 57. And if we subtract the mean from each one of those observations, we get these four deviations, minus 12, 7, 11, and minus 6. Let's plot those and have a look. Here are the four observations in a dot plot. The mean of 57 is indicated by this line. And we can see here that 45 is 12 units less than the mean, 51 is 6 units less, 64 is 7 units greater than the mean, and 68 is 11 units greater than the mean. The deviations are the signed distance from the mean. Note here that if we add all of these deviations, we end up with 0. The negative values and the positive values cancel out, and we end up with 0. This is true for any data set. The sum of the deviations is always zero. So adding the deviations doesn't make a lot of sense. But the deviations are still useful quantities. When we're interested in the variability of the observations, we don't care about the sign. We care about the distance from the mean. So one option that might come to mind is to ignore the sign and work with the absolute value of the deviations. So let's look at that. The mean absolute deviation is the mean of the absolute value of the deviations, or in other words, the average distance from the mean. Let's go back to the data and calculate the mean absolute deviation. Here again is a table with the deviations and the absolute value of the deviations. If we add the absolute value of all the deviations, we get 36 and the mean absolute deviation is the sum of those absolute value of the deviations, 36, over the number of observations, 4, and that is 9. On average, these four values are 9 units from the mean. The mean absolute deviation is a nice simple interpretation, the average distance from the mean. But it is not used very often. It is a useful descriptive measure of variability, but it is not used very often in statistical inference methods. Instead of working with the absolute value of the deviations, we usually work with the squared deviations. It's not obvious as to why we would choose to do that, but methods based on the squared deviations just work a little better. The sample variance s squared is the sum of squared deviations divided by n minus 1. We will use the sample variance s squared to estimate the population variance sigma squared. You might ask why divide by n minus 1 instead of n. And I'm going to gloss that over a little bit for now and state simply that dividing by n minus 1 results in a better estimator of the population variance sigma squared than if we were to divide by n. If you want to know more, I look at that in greater detail in another video. We can think of the variance as the average squared distance from the mean. The units of the variance are the square of the units of the variable. So if we are taking measurements in meters, 
then the variance has units of meters squared. To get back to the same units as the variable, we often take the square root of the variance. Let's look at that. By definition, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. The sample standard deviation, s, is the square root of the sample variance, s squared. The standard deviation has the same units as the variable. So if we are taking measurements in meters, then the standard deviation has units of meters. Both the variance and standard deviation are at least zero. S squared is bigger than or equal to zero, and S is bigger than or equal to zero. And they are only going to be equal to zero if every observation in the data set is equal. And the larger the variance or standard deviation, the greater the variability. Let's go back to our data. Here are the deviations once again, and the squared deviations. The variance formula tells us to square the deviations, sum them, and divide by n minus 1. Here if we added these squared deviations, we see that they sum to 350. And so the variance is equal to 350 over 4 minus 1. And that works out to 116.6 repeating. The standard deviation s is simply the square root of the variance, so the square root of 116.6 repeating, and that works out to 10.8 when rounded to one decimal place. Recall that we calculated a mean absolute deviation of 9. The standard deviation is always a little bigger than the mean absolute deviation. How much bigger depends on the shape of the distribution of the variable so I can't give you a simple rule relating them, but the standard deviation will be bigger than the mean absolute deviation. Here's a histogram representing the birth weights of 1,000 randomly selected Canadian boys. I've drawn in the mean at 3,433 grams. We cannot determine the precise value of the mean or any of the other values I'm about to give just from the histogram but I went back to the original raw data and calculated a few important quantities. The hope is that we get a bit of a feel for what these quantities mean in a distribution of values, and perhaps through time we can learn to roughly estimate these values from a histogram. The mean absolute deviation here is 454 grams. Coincidentally, that's a pound. On average, these babies are 454 grams away from the mean. The variance is 379,254 grams squared. The standard deviation is the square root of that, which works out to 616 grams. The standard deviation is a fair bit bigger than the mean absolute deviation for this data set. Because the variance and standard deviation involve the squared deviations, they can be sensitive to extreme values. Very large or very small values can tend to inflate the variance and standard deviation. And here we do have some extreme values out here in this left tail. Interpreting the variance and standard deviation is not all that easy. The variance is the average squared distance from the mean, and the standard deviation is the square root of that. So the standard deviation is the square root of the average squared distance from the mean. But that's tough to interpret. So let's look at something that might help us interpret the standard deviation. To interpret the standard deviation, it can be helpful to think of the empirical rule. The empirical rule is a rough guideline for mound-shaped distributions. Distributions that are bell-shaped or approximately normal, like the distribution we see here. We run into this type of distribution frequently. The empirical rule states that for mound-shaped distributions, approximately 68% of the observations lie within one standard deviation of the mean, approximately 95% of the observations lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and all or almost all of the observations lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Let's see what this looks like on a plot. Here's a mound-shaped, approximately normal distribution and I've cooked the book such that the mean is equal to exactly 50, and the standard deviation is equal to exactly 10. 
Here, the empirical rule tells us that from one standard deviation below the mean, or 40, to one standard deviation above the mean, or 60, we would expect to see approximately 68% of the observations. The empirical rule tells us that from two standard deviations below the mean to two standard deviations above, or from 30 to 70 in this case, we would expect to see approximately 95% of the observations. And the rule tells us that from three standard deviations below the mean to three standard deviations above, or from 20 to 80 in this case, we'd expect to see all or almost all of the observations. We see here that there are a few observations outside of three standard deviations from the mean, but it's a very small percentage of the values. The empirical rule can give us a bit of a feel for what the standard deviation means in terms of the dispersion of the variable. A few notes to finish. Here's the sample variance formula once again. There is an alternative formula that is sometimes used. It is an equivalent calculation formula, and it can help to reduce round-off error in hand calculations. It can help to use this formula from time to time, but these days it's not used as often as in the past because we often rely on software or calculators to carry out the calculations. And this formula up here is a little bit more intuitive. And on that note, I strongly recommend that you learn to use software or your calculator's pre-programmed functions to calculate the variance and standard deviation. It's useful to go through these calculations once or twice to get a feel for what the variance and standard deviation mean. But once we know how to do the calculations, it's best to offload the calculation burden to software or a calculator. And that's a brief introduction to measures of variability.